Amen. Amen. Hey, welcome to church. Glad you guys are here. Every week is kind of like, uh, it's like a, a grab bag. You just, you know, you never know what's going to happen and, and who's showing up to church. And I'm, I'm thankful that you're here today because I didn't know if this was the week where uh, we would uh, be just talking to online and there'd be three people in the room. So praise God for you. Thank you guys so much. Online, love you, love you, love you. And uh, glad you guys are tuning in today. Uh, I hope that this series has been encouraging to you. I hope it's not just head knowledge. I hope it's something that is now getting put to use in your day to day. And so uh, today, um, so I was actually going to cover three gifts today. I was going to cover the gift of faith, the gift of miracles, and, uh, and the gift of healing. And today, I'm only going to get to the gift of faith because I had so much. I was like, I'm just going to have to like slow down a bit. I had three weeks at the end of this series as a gap. And I'm going to use one of them today because uh, I'm just talking about the gift of faith today. There was way too much uh, to miss some of the really important things. So if you have not been with us, we've been going uh, through a week-by-week study of spiritual gifts. They are lift- listed in three different places, places in the Bible, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, and Romans 12. And so we're talking about the manifestation gifts right now. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to believers, those that place their faith in Christ. They now are given gifts to use. Why? For the edification and building up of the body of Christ. And so um, spiritual gifts, let me just define it again, and I'm going to jump into faith quickly. Spiritual gifts are powers, skills, abilities, knowledge given by God through the Holy Spirit to Christians. And Paul tells us that the church is the purpose of spiritual gifts, to edify, build up believers and the body of Christ, to glorify God in everything that we do and use. So when we talk about faith, faith is a word that's used all the time, right? It's used in secular world. It's used in every faith on the planet, every religious entity. They talk about this idea of faith. It's believing in something more than yourself. It's believing in an outcome that you can't possibly predict or control. And so we know this word well, but the truth about faith in God, the God we're going to talk about today, is that some people have a faith, but they're not always believing in the same thing. Faith in God is clearly defined, and we're going to have a, a good time today studying God's Word, but um, faith is primary to our belief. Everything that we know about God comes through faith that is given to us by God. And so I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I just want you to know where we're coming from. Verse 7, Paul says, Now to each one the manifestation, we just talked about that, manifestation gifts, of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, which we talked about uh, last week, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. So today, we're going to talk about faith. And I'm actually going to talk about faith in three different ways today. Now, this isn't the full summary of faith, but there are really three different types of faith. There is saving faith. There is worthless faith. And there is the gift of faith. And so today, let's talk about it, right? And so today, I'm just believing that maybe God's word is going to come alive for someone. And you're going to say, man, I need to say yes to saving faith. I- I've, I've kind of had an idea of faith, but man, it hasn't saved me. It hasn't brought me out. I'm still the same. So maybe today is your opportunity to receive saving faith. Maybe today you're going to acknowledge and, and understand in your own head and heart that maybe the faith that I've had is the worthless faith that I'm going to define today in God's word. Maybe today you would say, man, faith is so much more than that. God is so much more than that today. Or today you would say, I got saving faith and uh, I want to experience the gift of faith or I want to operate in faith. So uh, today we're going to start by talking about saving faith. I'm just going to read from God's word and then we're going to go on to worthless faith. But this is one of the clearest examples of what it means to give your heart to Christ. This is, uh, this is for those who do not believe. This is what it looks like. And for those who do believe, um, this is just encouragement. This is something you could use in your life. So saving faith is something that all believers have been given by God. It's the only way to salvation. And we believe our doctrines are that all people are given the opportunity to receive this. We believe that God's free gift through Jesus was for all people for all of time. And so let's read Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read 10 verses. It's a great gospel message if you need one. Paul says, as for you, talking to all of us, 
you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Not like you were messed up, not that you had a gunshot wound, but you were still kind of hanging on. You were dead in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. He's saying we were all that person before Jesus. Verse 3, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Not like we, we, we needed a spanking, <laughs> but we deserved spiritual death. It's what we deserved. In, in, in response to the holiness and the majesty of God, the only thing that is uh, appropriate for us as sinners is wrath and death. So, so you can never forget what we should have got, what was our destiny. But because of his great Love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. He didn't wait for you to figure it all out. He gifted it to you before you ever decided to receive it. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. This is saving faith. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, it's like you swimming out in the ocean by yourself, right? And there's no boat coming. There's no rescue coming. There's sharks all around you. And it's as if God said, I see you. I love you. I want you. I'll throw you a life vest when no one else can. There's no possible way for you to have faith in God without him first giving you faith. And so all of us have received a gift from God in faith, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. I love this verse. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Don't ever forget you're one of a kind. Don't ever forget you are God's handiwork, his masterpiece. He put his hands on you. He put his image on you. You're not a clone. You're not a duplicate. You're not just another one down the assembly line. He put his hands on you when he created you on purpose for purpose. That is so good that we need to know that today. We are God's handiwork. So this is saving faith. When you place your faith in Christ, you go from death to life, okay? Saving faith. Let's move on to worthless faith. Now we're going to read in Acts chapter 17, and this is one of Paul's strongest sermons, the strongest dialogues he would ever have in the New Testament is right here. And I want you to see the boldness it took for Paul to say this, but he is going to make it extremely clear. The difference between a faith that you can create, a faith that you have dreamt up, a faith that you have made for yourself, and faith in Christ, and how they are different. And how one is worthless and can do nothing to save you. One is eternally saving you. So Acts chapter 17, let's start in verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was waiting for his buddy Silas Timothy to come join him in Greece. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Okay, so Paul makes his way to Athens. Now, he had just been in Thessalonica and experienced a ton of torture, a ton of persecution. And so now he's going to Greece just to wait for his friends. He's not really there because he thinks this is like a mission for him. I'm just going to rest and wait. And that's what Athens was supposed to be for him. And so he says that he sees a city full of idols. And so many times for us, because we don't use this word in our language very often, but when we think of biblical idols, we think of like pendants and statues and gold and things like that, right? So how does idols translate to us in our modern world? For our context, idols could easily be seen as money, as status, as possessions, as relationships. It's anything that we exalt above God. 
And so as Paul was walking around Athens, kind of like a tourist, he's like, man, this city is full of idolatry. Okay, let's continue. Verse 17. It says, so he reasoned in the synagogue. He went to the church with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. His first response is, let me find the people that believe or say they believe, and I want to talk to them first, but you're going to see a shift here in a moment. As well as in the marketplace, went to the church, went to the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Whoever was around, Paul was speaking to them. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, right? You're like, what does that mean? Exactly. Really smart, influential people in Athens uh, are, are starting to show up and began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. You see, what seemed like babble to the people that had been consumed by worthless faith, that had given themselves over to idols and false religion, when, when Paul shows up and teaches the truth about Christ resurrected, about a gospel that could save you, they said, this is babble. This is madness. This makes no sense. You see, for those who are trying to make a faith that fits for them, they think that following Jesus and laying down their life and following him is crazy babble. So today, if our version of Christ looks a lot more like what we've created, what we have formed, what we have made him to be, then even right now, as I get through the next portions of this message, you might start thinking in your heart, this is crazy. This is babble. This is too much. And I would encourage you to open up your mind and heart because this is who Paul is talking to. You see, the Greeks have their gods. They have their idols. A resurrected Jesus makes no sense to them because they already had their gods. And so the gospel message of Jesus, it actually sounded like a foreign god to them because they had given themselves to false religion. Verse 19 it says, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus. Okay, what is this? This is so important that we understand what the Areopagus was. This was a Greek high council. These were the most influential thinkers and decision makers in Athens. And so these were the philosophers. These were the aristocrats. These were the lawyers. These were the king's right-hand men. And so for Paul to go from the, the synagogue and the marketplace, now he's talking to some smart people, but then they're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to take you into the Supreme Court. And now let's talk about it, Paul. What is you, are you actually saying? Where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. See, they hadn't heard the gospel before. They hadn't heard the truth about Jesus resurrected. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. What does the world have to say on this subject? How do we really have love? How do we really have reconciliation? How do we really experience true peace? How do we have eternal life? And so you would just have philosopher after philosopher coming in with new ideas, and these people would pivot and shift and change to adapt to a new teaching. And so Paul comes in and they say, ain't heard this one before. This is different. You see, we've always worshipped our idols and lived for ourselves. We've always lived by our own understanding. And so, Paul, what you're saying, this is very different. It's almost as if Paul would recite Proverbs chapter 3, Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. He's saying it's not about what you can create. It's not about what you can think of. It's not about what you devote yourself to that is of this world. This message is different. Verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, it, notice the exclamation point. Yo, people of Athens! He's not trying to like beat around the bush about what he's about to say. 
He's letting them know. I've been walking around your city. I've been seeing your idols everywhere. I'm talking to the smartest people and the most influential people in the city. And I can tell you do not get what I'm saying. So people of Athens, I see in every way that you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. And we'll see in the next couple of verses his proclamation. He acknowledges, man, y'all got all the religion you need. You got the statues, you got the idols, you got the bureaucrats, the aristocrats, you got everything you need. You got king, you got Greek gods, you got mythology, you got it all. But how is it that I'm going to walk around to something you worship and it says to an unknown God, you don't even know what you're worshiping. Now, we may not see this in our culture. We may not see statues and uh, monuments made up with signifies that says to an unknown God. But I can tell you in our life, some of the things that we worship, some of the things that we idolize, we don't even understand the worship we're giving to it. We, we don't even know. We, we've given our heart to some things. We've given our attention, our money, our, our resource to some things that have nothing to do with God while we're still believing that this religious act can save us and do something for us. Very religious would sum up a lot of our culture. We have a form of godliness, but we deny its power. So they had all the objects of worship. They had statues, they had monuments, we have Facebook statuses, we have t-shirts, we got bumper stickers. We got all these symbols that tell everyone else that I love God. We got monuments, but is it real in our heart? Or is this a false religion, a worthless faith? Verse 24, he says, tells them, I'm going to proclaim something to you, you've been ignorant. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's letting them know, I walk around your city and I see all the things that you've built with your hands and they're beautiful and they cost a lot of money. I bet you people walk by and marvel at it. But the God that we serve, he doesn't live in anything created by man. So you've been trying to create gods. You've been trying to form gods. You've been trying to contain God and control God. You've been trying to lessen him and amplify you, and it doesn't work that way. That's not what it means to surrender our heart to Christ. We are the created beings. We are not in control of God. And this would be a sucker punch to the philosophers and the thinkers of this day because that's what they understood about their religion. I could understand it here. It was all in my head and not in my heart. You see, our faith is in him, not in ourselves. And this would go against the very people he was teaching. Verse 25. And he, being God, is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. He's letting them know there's one source to everything, and it's God, not you. It's God, not your idols. It's God, not your false religion. It's God. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appropriated times in history. I love this, and I'll stop here for a moment because... This verse has been so real for right here, right now in the world we're living in. And I wonder, God, you appointed every person for every time. And I want you to know that in this moment, in this part of history, God appointed you to be in it. God appointed you to be here to show people the love of Christ. God appointed you to sit in this chair today. God appointed you to your family, your school, your job, your church. God appointed this. And why? Because he needs you. 
Now, and now he doesn't need us in the sense of he can't do it without us. But it was his idea to create us and work through us. And so in a sense, God wants to use us. God needs us so that his gospel can go forward for this appointed time. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Now Paul is essentially verse by verse, sentence by sentence, completely dismantling everything about their religion. I mean, he's, there's this whole deconstructing your faith movement, which is Drives me nuts in the millennial church. Let me just deconstruct everything. Let me tell you something. You were dead in sin and now you're alive in Christ. What do you need to deconstruct about that? Having said all that. Paul would have just wrecked their religious idea and their approach to God. When he said, you are his offspring. You are his children. You can't create God. You can't even contain God. You can't fit him into your box that you've created. He created you as sons and daughters. And so we're not worshiping what man has made. We're worshiping a father who created us. This would have went against everything they understood. Verse 29. He said, therefore, since we are God's offspring... We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. This is all they knew about gods. An image made by human design and skill. This isn't a man-made created thing. Watch this. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now, he commands all people everywhere to... Repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's saying there was a time where I would overlook some of this stuff because you just didn't get it. Because it hadn't been revealed through my son Jesus coming and dying and resurrecting. And now you having the truth in front of you. I overlooked it for a time, but ignorance is no longer an excuse. And so let me say something that will be challenging convicting maybe in the same sentence i want you to know that when you leave here today you can never say to god again in your life i didn't know i just gave you the gospel of ephesians 2 i just told you how you are saved and what it means to come into saving faith in christ never again one time can we ever plead ignorance on understanding what the truth is Jesus said, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you knock, I'll open the door. So today, we have an incredible opportunity to seek after a personal God. Paul finishes with this. He says, he has given proof, Jesus, to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Well, what's the proof? Jesus' resurrection. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Hmm. Hmm. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. I don't know if I believe everything you said, but I never heard it how you just said it. And I haven't met the resurrected Jesus, but it sounds like you have. And so I want to hear more. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Now, now, here's the truth. Sometimes we don't want to cut and dry the gospel to someone. We don't want to cut and dry the realities of heaven and hell. We don't want to cut right to the point because we just think, God, oh, they're going to get offended and not listen. These were the smartest philosophers that the world could produce. These were the least likely people to soften their heart and receive the message of Jesus. But God... I want you to know his word is enough. His presence is enough. His power is enough. Good news for you. It's never been about you or even in you. It's God working through you. That's good news.
What Paul had just said was treason. And it should have got him killed. Because he just opposed everything that they believed. This would have been blasphemy to their king. You see the favor of God protecting Paul and sending him along. But the truth is, is that the gospel is offensive. It just is. It doesn't, it doesn't agree with everything in our world. And so if we keep trying to make Jesus fit into our narrative, if we keep trying to make Jesus fit into our created box and being of him, we're always going to be on the other side of a worthless faith that can't do anything, that can't change things, that can't move. So I wonder today if someone has been worshiping the idols they've created, the God that they've dreamt up, and it's been a worthless faith. The last one we'll talk about today is the gift of faith. The gift of faith can be defined as the special gift where the Holy Spirit provides Christians with extraordinary confidence in God's promises, God's power, and presence so they can take heroic stands for the future of God's work in the church. That is not a biblical definition. That is one I saw that I felt captured this gift of faith. Gifts are given for the common good of building up and edifying the church. And so the spiritual gift of faith is shown by a strong, unshakable confidence in God, in his word, and in his promises. An unshakable faith. Let me use a couple of examples of this. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read about the hall of faith. And if you've been in church, you've probably read about incredible men, men from the Old Testament that trusted God fully and God did incredible superhuman things through them. And there's two I want to point out because when we talk about the gifts, we talk about the New Testament only because that's the Holy Spirit's indwelling in the life of a believer in a personal way. But the Holy Spirit surely was active in the Old Testament. It just wasn't the way we know it now where it was personable and available to everyone. But I see this gift of faith showing up when we talk about the Hall of Faith. People that had extraordinary trust in God and his promise. How about Noah? Noah's just a regular dude, loving God, but no one special, didn't have great skills, didn't have great intellect, didn't have great influence. God shows up. God tells him, Noah, I need you to build a boat. Now, here's the crazy thing. He doesn't even know what a boat is because up to that point, it had never rained on earth once. Build a boat, a big boat. I'm going to give you the specifications. You have to build it. It's going to take you a while. How long? 120 years. For 120 years, I need you to keep going back to the faith that believes that what I told you to do, what I said to you, is from me. But I don't need you to just build a boat. For 120 years, I need you to go and proclaim God to people who don't believe. Surely there's going to be this massive revival. And people are going to be showing up day after day and giving their heart to God. For 120 years, not one person. Not one. So, so what does the gift of faith show up and do? The gift of faith says, Noah, hold on. Noah, trust and believe that I have promised to bring you out of this. You see Jesus in this being rejected and scorned and despised. You see, you need supernatural faith to get rejected and to keep building something that you can't possibly understand what it's meant to do. You've never seen rain. So maybe one example of a gift of faith. Abraham, believing that he would father a child. I'm giving you Old Testament examples on purpose. I want you to see that faith is in the very nature of God. And so, yes, it's a gift to the New Testament believer, but this has been available and been in God's heart since the very beginning of time. So Abraham was promised a child. Yeah, God, but you don't get it. My wife's 90. Mother, you're way younger than that. You ready to have some kids? Probably not. That's not something you're praying about, right? Well, Sarah was praying about it a lot. And God promised 
a child. You see, without the gift of faith, without an unshakable, wavering grapple hold on the promise that God had given Abraham, you walk away from that. You say, it's been too long, God. Why haven't you done it yet? You see the gift of faith. You see this unbelievable faith that holds on to the promises of God. This is what the gift of faith can be in the New Testament believer. Now, are we given saving faith for those who are in Christ? Yes. That's all you need for eternal life. But there are times where God will give specific people an unshakable, undeniable, unbreakable faith that God will. And so maybe you've experienced that in your life. Maybe just for a moment when the doctor said something or your husband said something or something happened with your child and you felt as if there was no way and God gave you a supernatural faith to believe him when most would walk away and say, I'm going to go create something that can fix this. But you held on to the promise of God. I would say that was the gift of faith being used in you. Now, it's to build up and to edify the church, but the people of God are the church. And if you are in Christ, God could have used that to build you up, to encourage you, to strengthen you. So people of the gift of faith are so convinced that the obstacles to the gospel and to God's purposes will be overcome. They're so confident that God will continue to complete his mission, his cause. And oftentimes people with this gift can do far more than pastors and teachers ever could. Because they rely on God alone. He is their source. Let me ask you a question. How many times in the Bible do you think the word faith is mentioned? Who thinks it's 100 times? Raise your hand. 200 times? More than 200 times? Raise your hand. More than 200 times? Okay. How many times do you think it's mentioned in the Old Testament? Over 100? Less than 100? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up. Less than 50? Less than 10? Less than 5? Two times. Because the kind of faith that can save you is found in Jesus. There are 247 mentions of faith in the New Testament directly related to saving faith in Jesus. It's twice in the Old Testament. You see it in Deuteronomy chapter 32 where God is complaining about the lack of faith of his people. Now, it's not that faith didn't exist. Surely faith did, and people were commended in Hebrews 11 for their faith. But the faith that we know today, the saving faith, the faith that can change everything about us was found in Jesus. And so they were anticipating a Messiah where now we have him. And so now we're called to live in this reality of faith. I'm going to read one portion of scripture, and this will be basically how you can, an example of how you can see faith. I'll finish with this. Acts chapter 3, the gift of faith at work. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. <laughs> so the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, although that's what he was asking for. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. 
And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Okay. Now, again, this is an isolated event. And we're going to talk more about this next week when we talk about miracles and healing. Okay. We're going to talk through what just happened. But I want you to see what Peter does. And let everyone know where this faith just came from. Peter speaks to the onlookers. Verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John. All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? Why do you think that we just did this on our own? Verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Watch this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Just some no. I don't know how God chose to do this. I don't know why God chose to use me in this moment. But my faith was in Jesus, not in myself. And he lets them know quite clearly. And this has been a struggle throughout church history where people, as soon as a healing, as soon as a miraculous thing happens, they want to exalt themselves above God and they want to promote themselves above the power of God. And really the power they acknowledge isn't the power that comes from God. It's the power that they can produce for themselves. And so there has been manipulation of where the power comes from. And Peter says, yo, I need all y'all to know because you're starting to ramble and think that I'm the one who did this, but it really wasn't me. It was Jesus. And I'm so thankful that he used me. And so you see the gift of faith in this interaction. In fact, you see the gift of faith, you see the gift of healing, and you see the gift of miracles all in one. Like I said, next week we're going to talk about healings and miracles. Um, but you see this, but it started with faith. Peter's not saying it's my great faith. He's acknowledging that faith is given by Jesus. We, we can't even beg for faith. God gives it. Now, we can open our hands and we can receive it, but we give it, God gives it as a gift. Let me summarize where faith comes from. God gives every Christian saving faith. God gives every person on this planet the opportunity to receive saving faith. God is calling us out of worthless faith, a faith that has created a God for us, a God that has contained and controlled by us. Culture can't save you. Politicians can't save you. Pastors can't save you. The resurrected Jesus can. That's where our faith becomes real. It's calling some of us out of worthless faith. The last one is the spiritual gift of faith. A faith that believes that the Holy Spirit can do extraordinary things through His promises, His Word, His power, His presence, and will allow us for moments to take heroic stands for God or to do incredible, immeasurable things that we could never do on our own. And so today I would love if we could pray in the same way that we've been praying. Just open up our hands. God, if I have man-made idols, God, if I have religion that has controlled me, it's been about what I do and what I don't do. It's been about what I can produce, what I can create, what I can control. God, if I have that religious spirit in me, God, would you, would you rip that from my heart today? Because that can't save me. That can't change me. God, you can't even use that. A faith that puts us as God is worthless. So God, would you, um, would you reveal to us through your word, 
what it means to trust you, what it means to follow you, what it means to depend on you. God, today, would you increase our faith? Would you increase our trust in our dependence on you? In the same way the Apostle John said in chapter 3, that I must decrease so that he can increase. He must become greater and I must become less. That's what it means to have faith. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the solutions. I cannot save myself. So God. So today, if you're here and you would say, I don't have a, I don't have a saving faith. Maybe I've had forms of religion. I've had forms of belief. But, but I don't have a faith that has saved me. I haven't went from death to life. I maybe made a few behavior modifications in my life, but I didn't really give over ownership. I still hold the deed. I still hold the title. I'm still in control. I'm still at the top. If that's you today, God extends his hands towards you. He throws you a life vest while you're drowning in the ocean. Put this on, I'll save you. You can turn away from your old way. You can turn away from your old sin. You can repent, which means to acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of saving. You can turn away from that and run towards Jesus today. You could be set free. You could experience the trueness of saving faith that's you today when we're done with our service we're gonna have a couple people up front for prayer we would love it if you would come and let us know that you made a decision to follow Christ today that you want to transfer ownership of your life we want to pray with you get you a Bible you really should join this midweek study Wednesday night finding Jesus in the Old Testament if you're here today and you say man my faith kind of sounds a little bit worthless Sounds like I've added a lot to the saving faith that it started with. I've added a bunch of religion to it. Today, God, would you reveal that to us, God, so that we can hand it over to you. We can open our hands. God, would you take that, those worthless things, those things that can't change us, they can't sustain us, they can't save us, they can't rescue us, they can't bless us. God, would you rip those things from us? And would you replace it, God? with your nature, your spirit, God. That's what we need today. God, I thank you for your presence. Jesus, for this next moment as we sing and praise you, God, I pray that faith would erupt, faith would arise. God, we would trust you and depend on you like we never have before. And so even for the believer that's here today and saying, man, I've been trusting myself a lot recently. Maybe right now is an opportunity to hit the reset button and acknowledge in all our ways that he is God. So God, in this next moment, would you move our hearts, change our hearts? We ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet as we close?